Welcome back. I'm still Philipp Krüppel and I'm guiding you today through our event series Arch Plus features Stuttgart Talks on Architecture X Igma Day. Now we will watch a lecture by Professor Trüby about POMO, Postmodernity in Stuttgart. This is the last lecture of the series Einführung in die moderne Architekturtheorie for our bachelor students. Professor Trüby will talk about Rob Creer, he will talk about the Staatsgalerie Gallery debates and he will talk about the Architektur der Zukunft conference in 1981. He will also guide you through our institute and talk about the highly interesting drawings which you can see for instance in the back. These drawings were made by Gustav Peichel who was not only an architect but also a cartoonist. Well then, let's have a look. I would like to welcome you to the Stuttgart Talks on Architecture to the fifth edition actually of uh, our Stoa talk, the Stuttgart Talks on Architecture. Uh, and for the first time I would like to talk actually about Stuttgart, about a specific topic called uh, postmodernism in Stuttgart, POMO in Stuttgart. And I would like to tell you a story about um, the architect Rob Krier, the Staatsgalerie debates and a conference that took place in this city here in 1981 called Architektur der Zukunft, Zukunft der Architektur in English, Architecture of the Future, Future of the Architecture. This uh, lecture is also part of a um, lecture series I give at uh, Stuttgart University um, as part of a um, lecture series called Evolution of Modern Architecture History. This is the last lecture of uh, this semester. It's the final um, lecture uh, and um, uh, you can imagine that it is quite important to come to terms with this term called postmodernity in a lecture series called Evol Evolution of Modern Architecture Theory. What do we actually talk about when we talk about modern architecture, when we talk about modernity? Um, and please allow me to um, start with a few introductory words about um, my understanding of modernity and the links to modern architecture. As we all know, um, the um, s kind of announcements, the death announcements of modernity and modern architecture are not at all rare. We probably have all seen images like this here, the Stanley Tigerman's ta uh, um, collage called Titanic, uh, the um, crown hall by Mies van der Rohe, by Mies van der Rohe um, uh, disappearing in the Lake Michigan uh, uh, collage from 1978. And almost like an echo of this very famous collage uh, 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 two years ago, uh, this image or this project, this art piece uh, circulated through um, the media. The project Flooded Modernity by Asmund Hafstein, uh, not the Crown Hall, but the Villa Savoie. Uh, disappearing uh, in in a lake uh, in this time not the lake Michigan not the Lake Michigan but the value fjord um, uh, in Denmark again uh, a death announcement of modern architecture it's probably not uh, Charles Jenks was wasn't probably the first one who announced the death of modern architecture but he uh, mentioned even an exact date uh, uh, which he linked to the idea of a death of the modern movement of modern architecture. He uh, said that, uh, the modern, that modern architecture died on 15th of July 1972 at 3 um, p.m. Uh, at 3.32 p.m when uh, the Prit Igo um, estate was um, demolished, um, uh, Prit Igo uh, settlement uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. This was again 1978, the same year when Stanley Tigerman produced his collage. Uh, 
So we all know more or less these death announcement of modernity, of modern architecture. At the same time, and especially uh, through the last couple of years, and probably not only in the German-speaking context, um, advertisements like this appeared. Uh, for example, an art exhibition, an exhibition on the work of Lukas Kranach, with the subtitle Master Trademark Modernity, or an exhibition on Martin Luther um, uh, happened uh, with, a, um, with a subtitle uh, Luther and the Avant-Garde. Uh, it's um, uh, an exhibition um, uh, that took place in Wittenberg, Berlin and Kassel in 2017. So at the same time, more or less, when uh, the death announcement of modernity appeared, um, also the term modern, the term modernity, the term avant-garde in this case was linked towards something that is actually very um, um, contemporary, um, if you allow me to say so. So uh, this is the reason why I would like to share with you some thoughts about uh, some thoughts about uh, the relative uh, degree zero points of modernity, um, and one of these points of degree zero is probably the querelle des anciens et des modernes, the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns that took place around 1690, so uh, at the end of them. Um, 18th, uh, 17th century, this quarrel was uh, a quarrel uh, in the field of literature, but also in the field of architecture. In the field of architecture, it was mainly a quarrel between two famous protagonists. On the one hand, François Plaudin um, and uh, Claude Perron on the other side. Uh, François Plaudin um, believed uh, a lot in the authority of antiquity, of Greek and Roman antiquity, while the mod he was an ancient, while the moderns, and in this case Claude Perron, argued that also the contemporary situation uh, around 1690, the age of Louis XIV, uh, demanded also uh, a kind of uh, um, uh, re reflection and production of art and architecture that uh, not only uh, imagined itself as something being in the shadow of antiquity. And uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, architectural results of this quarrel was uh, the eastern facade of the Louvre, um, completed in 1680 with these famous row of double columns, a piece by Claude Perron. And uh, I would like to share with you the idea that this is maybe a relative degree uh, zero point of modern architecture. But we could also argue that uh, another degree zero point of modern architecture happened more or less 100 years later uh, in the context of the French Revolution and the time right before the French Revolution and also the time right after the French Revolution. So now we are not talking about the time around 1690, the age of Louis XIV, but uh, uh, we are talking about the age around 1790, 1789, and the following years following the French Revolution. And I'm sure you have all heard about um, the so-called uh, French revolutionary architects, uh, people like um, Etienne Louis Boulet, who was not at all um, uh, a re revolutionary, uh, on the contrary, he was a monarchist and royalist, and he uh, wrote a book uh, called Essay sur l'art. There's also an English and a German translation, um, which is a highly interesting treatise, uh, also because he more or less, Boulet more or less, reduced architecture to the act of painting. And uh, uh, Boulay produced uh, architectural drawings like this here, the, his um, 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 rendering of the Bibliothèque de Roi from 1785, or paintings or renderings like this here, the Tombeau, the Spartiat. What we see here is a um, uh, highly interesting um, uh, architecture, an idea of architecture 
stripped of the idea of decorum, the, the idea of the correct use of ornamentation, the correct use of the five orders, etc. Um, what we see here is also the idea, of the, one of the first um, maybe realizations of uh, the idea of a more or less naked architecture uh, with pure volumes under the sun which might be linked to what we uh, call later modern architecture. Uh, the um, art historian Emil Kaufmann argued, for example, in this line um, uh, of argumentation. Another uh, protagonist of the French revolutionary architects, the so-called French revolutionary architects, is Claude Nicolas Ledoux, who um, who uh, produced drawings like this here, for example, uh, um, at the house of, um, um, of, the, uh, of a wheel maker or the tonnelier uh, in the shape of, um, of a wheel or uh, the house of a woodcutter in the shape of uh, stacked uh, pieces of wood. Um, this is interesting because um, um, more or less for the first time the idea of an architecture specific to a certain profession appeared. So the rules of architecture weren't derived from feudal um, ideas of social strata, but uh, the rules of architecture or the images of architecture were linked to, um, the, uh, to the idea of a profession, uh, which obviously is a, is a post-feudal idea um, and uh, an idea that is uh, somehow on the threshold between an, a feudal age and a, an, and, an, uh, and a bourgeois age. The next, uh, my next try to establish a kind of uh, degree zero of modern architecture is probably uh, the time around 1850, 1851 time when the first um, expo uh, happened in London, the first World Expo happened. We all know this um, highly uh, prominent, this famous building that got constructed in this context, uh, the Crystal Palace by Joseph Paxton and others, um, one of the first buildings where the idea of a prefabricated um, uh, architecture also got realized with um, repercussions until uh, basically now. What I uh, find fascinating about a, a building like this here is that the um, more or less the whole uh, kind of highly Eurocentric idea of the world um, got um, basically assembled um, under one roof. Peter Sloterdijk, the German philosopher, chose for that reason also the image of the Crystal Palace as the cover image for his uh, book In the World Interior of Capital. So the idea of world trade under one roof, under one glass roof, um, is uh, uh, probably perfectly linked to the Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace was probably the first world trade center. And it's probably no surprise that this idea of a, of a transparent or translucent roof um, in the context of an expo um, was, uh, um, yeah, got, became a fascination for decades and decades. Uh, even in the second of the, tw of the 20th century, the German architects uh, and engineers, Frey Otto, Rolf Gutrud and Fritz Leonhardt, made an effort to assemble uh, uh, products and um, cultural goods and uh, activities under one translucent roof, in this case, the German pavilion at the Expo Montreal in 1967. Some of you might know that uh, all these three architects and engineers are uh, linked to the cityscape of Stuttgart and it's probably just a, a very superficial link but um, some people uh, argue that the gentle slopes of Stuttgart um, um, maybe provoke also a kind of uh, 
an architecture like this here and, 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 and an architecture based on the idea not the cave but the tent um, and uh, the idea of a gentle landscape and gentle slopes but we if we look closely at this uh, city of Stuttgart we not only see uh, these gentle slopes and uh, maybe also uh, romantic traditions um, uh, in architecture and beyond architecture but we also see in this case uh, always a city that became um, that was always at least in the 20th and 20th century attracted by the idea of a modernity almost like a counterpart to uh, romantic ideas um, of architecture and culture um, one of the one of my really uh, favorite buildings is uh, this minor uh, skyscraper called Tagplatturm, a building still existing today um, by an architect called Ernst Otto Oswald and completed in 1928, more or less the same year when this uh, uh, Siedlung, you probably all have heard of the Weisenhof Siedlung, got completed. This one was completed in, in 1927, so one year before 1928. Also here, uh, a pretty radical effort in a city uh, like Stuttgart to um, to make an experiment with modern architecture and architecture based on uh, industrialization, prefabrication, etc. I won't go into the details and probably also the um, um, uh, yeah paradoxes of uh, this seed long, but I would like to share with you another uh, um, a, a few other images that show also a certain tradition of modernity in this city called Stuttgart. For example, in the, um, in the late 1960s, Egon Eiermann, the German architect, uh, constructed the IBM campus uh, um, in, uh, yeah, in a, with the help of a kind of very modern um, architecture. But we shouldn't uh, re reduce the idea of modernity always to the architectural object, but we should also mention that the cityscape and the whole idea of infrastructure, especially in Stuttgart, was placed on modern ideas of um, uh, traffic flows, of automobility, um, uh, etc., etc. Uh, a very famous, uh, and uh, I have to say a really also infamous um, square in Stuttgart is this square called Austrian Square, Österreichische Platz, completed in 1960. Five. Uh, it's a, a fascinating um, uh, idea of a, a 20th, late 20th century or uh, 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 20th century square, um, uh, mainly based on the idea of traffic flow and infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, how it, uh, this Austrian square uh, looks today. One of those squares that. Uh, contributed to a pretty bad reputation of Stuttgart being a, an ugly city. I can't share uh, this impression, but it's definitely a fascinating effort uh, with um, obviously also problematic outcomes, but it's also, um, um, we, we need to understand uh, an artifact like this also from the optimist and optimism of uh, 1960s infrastructure. When we talk about modernity and Stuttgart, we should also mention really the successes of modern architecture, like uh, this settlement, this Siedlung called Hannibal. Um, uh, that's actually a nickname of, um, of a settlement called Wohnstadt Asenwald. Um, a very successful uh, modern um, district in Stuttgart, successful until today. Uh, uh, yeah, an apartment, uh, a sequence of apartment buildings completed in 1972. And just to finish my little collection of uh, uh, fascinating modern architecture and infrastructure in Stuttgart, I would like to share you this year the so-called Kleiner Schlossplatz, the small um, castle square in Stuttgart, also completed in 1968. 
demolished a couple of years ago. Um, uh, again, here the idea, the modern idea of um, of separating different kinds of traffic, the tram uh, versus the cars versus the pedestrians. Uh, yeah, this is an this was an interesting experiment. Many people thought it failed completely. Others think it's it was so much better than everything that is existing now at this place. Yeah, that's how this square looked like uh, in the nineteen seventies with uh, uh, the the remnants of an old building called Kronprinzenpalais right next to the. Uh, tram and uh, also um, uh, the, uh, a treatment of the public square by the artist uh, Hayek. One really final example now um, is this highly fascinating settlement called Tep Tapachstraße, still existing today in Stuttgart Roth by Feller and Schröder, uh, um, an experiment uh, of an, an heroic experiment of a um, of a terrace uh, house, a terrace apartment building. Um, yeah, again, uh, pretty successful until today. Yeah, Stuttgart, the, one of the capitals of modern architecture and modernity in Stuttgart, I would say, and uh, also a city where uh, a, a certain generation of postmodern architectures arrived and they completed, completely hated the city. I'm talking especially about the Krier brothers, Rob Krier and uh, Leon Krier, both studied and worked for a while in Stuttgart and uh, the main reaction of the Krier brothers, um, born both in Luxembourg uh, towards Stuttgart was completely erasing it. And uh, Rob Krier even produced a manifesto, an urban manifesto, Unfortunately, more or less forgotten outside Stuttgart um, and even within Stuttgart, uh, a manifesto um, about Stuttgart uh, called Stadtraum, um, uh, urban space in English. Uh, um, uh, and this manifesto was produced in the year 1975. So very early, two, three years before the, collage, before the book Collage City by Colin Rowe and Fred Cotter, there was already a really precise manifesto existing of um, a postmodern urbanism. And this manifesto had its object and theme, found its object and theme in Stuttgart. And um, basically what Rob Krier argued for is uh, getting rid of the, the free-floating urban space of automobility and uh, tr uh, urban traffic and traffic flows of Stuttgart and filling up the cityscape of Stuttgart by defined urban squares uh, with a... Um, yeah, uh, so, every, the, kind of the, the, yeah, the, the open uh, uh, cityscape of automobility should be abandoned and uh, getting replaced by an urban sequence and, and sequence of urban squares like this. So this was 1975. Two years ago, a highly important, probably one of the most important competitions uh, uh, in the second half of, um, um, of the 20th century took place in Stuttgart and I'm talking about the competition for the new Staatsgalerie in Stuttgart. Um, and uh, the Staatsgalerie uh, debate, um, the Staatsgalerie competition uh, resulted in this uh, first place uh, in the competition. Uh, you probably know that James Sterling and Michael Wilford won the first prize with this uh, absolutely fascinating arrangement of spaces and museum spaces and urban spaces and uh, this was as I mentioned already in 1977 and a big and very heated debate about the merits and problems of postmodern architecture took place in Stuttgart and in the whole of Germany. Basically the protagonists um, of this debate 
were um, Stuttgart-based uh, architects and engineers like Frei Otto and Günter Benisch on the one hand, and others on the other hand. And these others weren't uh, James Sterling. James Sterling was very mute uh, within the context of this debate. He stayed silent, and but others uh, argued for and against this kind of architecture. This debate um, is hardly unknown in the non-German-speaking uh, uh, parts of the world. And, uh, I brought you. Uh, I would like to show you some newspaper articles here. An article by Frei Otto and Bertolt Burkhardt, a German engineer. Um, they asked brutalism in Stuttgart, so they they saw. Um, uh, in the uh, architecture, in, in the future architecture of James Sterling and Michael Wilford's uh, New Staatsgalerie, a brutalist architecture, and they were really shocked about uh, this um, uh, project. Uh, also, um, because they lost the competition, or they only ran a third or second prize, and they also wanted to defend, obviously, their home markets. Um, basically, Frei Otto and Bertolt Burkhardt wrote in this article, um, first published in the Stuttgarter Zeitung, uh, the architecture of modernity is dead. 20 years ago, Sterling's design would have been unthinkable because it looked so fascist. And they also wrote, um, and they, they complained that, um, they asked um, in a tone of complaint, where is the fairy tale in architecture? Where's uh, the, 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 the jolly um, architecture? Why is everything so serious? Um, so they basically, they looked at the competition entry, the, at the drawings and thought, this is um, that serious piece, uh, uh, this is a that serious piece of monumental architecture. I'm sure they would have called the, um, the, the New Staatsgalerie completed by uh, James Stone and Michael Wilford in a different way when they uh, would have waited until the realization, uh, the finalization and completion of this project, which is of obviously, which has its references to monumentalism on the one hand, but it also is um, uh, very playful uh, on uh, uh, in other parts of the building. It's a highly interesting balance between seriousness and playfulness. Um, and one of the architecture historians and theorists arguing against Frei Otto, arguing against Günter Benisch and Bertolt Burkhardt was uh, Jürgen Jürdicke, my um, successor and the, the founder of the institute, which I, uh, um, I'm, um, uh, which I'm uh, happy to uh, direct now, the IGMA. Uh, he basically defended uh, James Sterling's and Michael Wilford's architects against the, um, uh, the criticism of being a piece of uh, brutalist or even fascist or fasc fascistoid architecture. Uh, he, Jung Jürdicke, um, also said that um, uh, he tried to be open towards certain developments uh, linked to uh, the term postmodern architecture, which is interesting because Jürgen Jürgen founded this institute called IGMA, which um, uh, is called Institut für Grundlagen Moderne, Institute for Principles of Modern Architecture. So the whole institute is based on the idea of, um, of teaching modern architecture definitely not in a purely stylistic um, uh, sense, but also in a, in a kind of um, um, ideological sense, probably. Even though Jürgen Jürgen probably wouldn't have liked the idea of ideology in architecture. But he was deeply skeptical about the attack of people like Frei Otto and Günter Benisch against James Sterling. Um, and he basically asked Frei Otto to, um, to wait and to postpone uh, a final um, um, argument. And a long, until now unpublished, highly fascinating exchange of letters between Frei Otto on the one hand and Jürgen Mürtiger on the other hand uh, followed and uh, we will 
uh, go into the details of this exchange of letters sooner or later. So all this happened in 1977, uh, uh, two years after Rob Creer's publication on Stuttgart, one year before the publication of Collage City and other um, uh, books on postmodern urbanism. And a few years later, in the year of 1981, Jürgen Jödicke, as the head of the IGMA, uh, organized uh, a highly interesting and very important conference, also more or less unknown outside the German-speaking part of the world, uh, which resulted in this book publication called Architektur der Zukunft, Zukunft der Architektur, Architecture of the Future, Future of Architecture, where, uh, so all this happened also one year after uh, the first um, Venice um, Architecture Biennial organized by Paolo Portuguesi and uh, organized under the title The Presence of the Past. One year later, it was the, not the topic of the past, but of the future was in the center of um, this um, uh, conference and also this book publication. And when we look at the, the people, the protagonists, the speakers there uh, at this um, 1981 conference, it's interesting that um, one could say that uh, an older generation of European modernists like Jakob Bakema, Max Bill, um, Alfred Roth and others met more or less for the first time um, American, uh, uh, Austrian and Polish postmodernists like Charles Moore, Hans Hollein and speaking of Pininsky. This conference was extremely packed. It took place here at Stuttgart University in 1981. Here in the center of this image we see Alfred Roth um, speaking. Some of you know Alfred Roth as um, the former um, ETH professor for architecture who made his uh, first, um, who earned his first merits in the field of architecture as the project leader of Le Corbusier's two houses at the Weissenhof. The accompanying book um, uh, was uh, published also by Alfred Roth in 1920. 27, 1928. And the same Alfred Roth, um, now being um, really uh, definitely older, um, uh, yeah, uh, designed an extension of, uh, of the Weissenhof uh, settlement. And this drawing was presented in the context of this competition here. Actually, the whole there was a hidden agenda uh, in this uh, com uh, conference because Jürgen Jüdicke invited all his guests to come up with ideas uh, for um, yeah for uh, those parts of the Weisenhof uh, Siedlung that weren't um, existing anymore uh, uh, in its uh, original uh, situation. Uh, so here in the center, right before the Mies van der Rohe block and uh, right uh, next to the two Le Corbusier buildings and, um, and the Josef Frank buildings on the right hand side, in the middle of this uh, uh, area of the Weisenhof Siedlung, uh, no original buildings uh, of the Weisenhof um, are um, uh, present anymore. And for this area, uh, Jürgen Jürgen invited his guests to come up with proposal, pro proposal for a future architecture. So this was Alfred Roth's proposal, uh, a proposal based on the idea that the Weisenhof Academy, the Academy of Fine Arts, which is neighboring the Weisenhof Siedlung, should, could have been extended to the Weisenhof Siedlung with a little museum, with a studio houses, etc., etc. And he come, came up with some plans, all published in this little book. And um, also Max Bill, who uh, um, yeah, as you probably know, designed the campus of the HFG Ulm, one of the Bauhaus um, uh, uh, kind of one of those institutions in post-war Germany, inspired by the idea of, uh, of the Bauhaus and inspired by the idea of a continuity of the Bauhaus. He came up with. 
something that uh, resembles um, or, or echoes uh, definitely this uh, architecture in Ulm for the HFG. Another proposal by Walter Förderer, um, a kind of uh, highly artistic, uh, sculptural um, Swiss architect uh, who became prominent for his brutalist churches, very sculptural, beautiful churches in, in, um, in Switzerland. He came up with a highly narrative idea of a new um, landscaped center for the Weisenhof Siedlung. Um, and this, these drawings were presented by Charles Moore. Charles Moore presented basically an anti-thesis of the five points of architecture, which were, as you probably know, for the first time presented to the public in the context of the Weisenhof Siedlung. And uh, instead of um, the piloti and the, and the um, uh, uh, roof garden, Charles Moore um, presented uh, a new five points of architecture which were basically just uh, a reversal of the Le Corbusier's points, so pitched roof, etc., etc. You see this result of the Charles Moore five points in these images here, pitched roof, um, no uh, kind of um, uh, long windows, uh, but, but defined uh, standing windows, etc., etc. This was the proposal by speaking of Pininski, the Polish architect and artist who uh, presented again a highly narrative, a highly obscure uh, piece of architecture slash art and a building uh, turned upside down based on the idea of an atlas carrying not uh, the sky but the foundation of a traditional house. And uh, all these drawings and uh, proposals for the future of architecture and the architecture of the future um, uh, at the Weissenhof Siedlung were presented here at Stuttgart, Stuttgart University at the foyer. Well, we um, have also some, we all have the originals here at my institute, um, also the originals by Gustav Peichel, um, who basically one year after the um, Sada Novissima, the, um, the, uh, of uh, the first uh, Venice Architecture Biennial uh, organized by Paolo Portuguesi, he, Hans, uh, Gustav Peichel, proposed a kind of um, uh, a wasteland of the garbage of postmodernism right in front of, uh, right in the middle of the Weissenhof. Siedlung. And the most fascinating and the most bizarre and most enigmatic uh, drawings were presented by Hans Holler and another guest by Jürgen Jötike. We have some of the originals hanging here at this institute and I would suggest that we just stand up at this moment. I would like to show you these originals by Hans Holler right now. Um, you, would you please follow me? Okay, what we, we are here uh, still at the ICMA. What we see here are the, uh, or some of the originals of Hans Hollein um, uh, executed for the architecture uh, of the future, future of architecture conference in uh, 1989. The topic was the future of architecture in general, but the future of the Weissenhof Siedlung in particular. Uh, we see here a couple of Hans Hollein originals um, this is highly fascinating. What we see here is almost like a comment on the Strada Novissima by Paolo Portuguese, um, a sequence of facades standing right before uh, the Mies van der Rohe apartment block. What we see here is, um, are, are, um, is, is a selection, is a sequence of Hans Hollein facades. Um, here we see the Reti. Uh, shop or uh, the uh, shop for a fashion store in Vienna, um, the Austria, his Austrian Nale contribution and other projects. Um, and we see here almost like a western town saloon atmosphere with a grand piano uh, in the center uh, in proximity to the double house by Le Corbusier. A direct comment to 
the Strada Novissima by Paulo Portoghese. Another original by Hans Hollein we see here. Hans Hollein asked himself what would the Weissmuchsiedlung uh, look like when the two most important Stuttgart-based architecture at that time in the early 80s would um, extend the um, the Weissmuchsiedlung, Frei Otto and Bodo Rasch, Bodo Rasch the architect uh, who built a lot in Mecca, Mecca and Medina, uh, Frei Otto who also built in, uh, in uh, a lot in the Arab world and uh, so we would finally have the Arab village um, that was um, attributed, the idea of the Arab village uh, attributed to the Weisnow Siedlung by the National Socialists in the 1930s. Another uh, original by Hans Hollein is this here, and this is almost a direct comment to the Staatsgalerie debate, which was about uh, the idea of um, modernity, uh, fascism, uh, monumentality, etc. And Hans Hollein, it's a highly disturbing drawing, uh, enigmatic, but also highly disturbing, very strong uh, drawing, because uh, uh, Hans Hollein asked himself and his audience, uh, is that fascist architecture? It's a purely modern architecture based on repetition, on industrialization. We see a concentration camp situation um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a watchtower uh, and, uh, and, a, um, and a fence um, in the middle of the Weissenhausiedlung. And uh, um, yeah, Hans Holland asked himself, is this fascist architecture? Question mark. Please follow me to the institute. Um, Hello. Hello, Stefan. Um, we chose uh, here the floor of the Staatsgalerie building by Sterling Wilford as a almost like a light motif of the institute because uh, this institute, which is the first um, institute for architecture theory in Germany established um, in 1968, exactly 25 years after the foundation, the um, Staatsgalerie debate took place in the early 1980s and we thought, okay, this crisis um, uh, of the discourse on modern architecture is probably the right moment to start um, a debate about um, modernity, modern architecture, postmodern architecture. Etc. And yeah, that's our little library, or part of our library. And here you see also the, the three originals by Gustav Peichel I mentioned in a minute before, with um, this highly fascinating drawing here. Again, the um, waste, the, the, the garbage of uh, the Stalin Novissima right in the middle of the Weissenhofsiedlung. Hi Eva. Hello. Okay, here we are at the other end of the institute again. The color of the green Staatsgalerie floor appears. It's a green called the Ipswich green. Uh, what we see here is um, actually, these are some of the letters of Jürgen Jüdicke. Uh, that's our Jürgen Jüdicke archive. Um, Jürgen Jüdicke, one of the most influential um, art historians uh, uh, since the 1960s and 70s in Germany, was in uh, close contact with uh, more or less uh, every um, important um, architect and historian um, at his time. And uh, we inherited here all his letters uh, and uh, we archived them here for future uh, research. What we also have here is, uh, are, are parts of Jürgen Jüdicke's library um, and uh, yeah, all organized here uh, in this Ipswich green um, bookshelf. Yeah, let's go back to my office. Here we are again. Um, the conclusion. Um, I mentioned before that James Sterling remained pretty silent uh, within that debate and um, you might ask yourself 
uh, if he didn't comment at all um, on this debate, uh, let's keep in mind that um, this debate of uh, of this, uh, this link, uh, complex link between architecture and ideology, between architecture and fascism, in this case, was um, was a debate by um, mainly uh, uh, German Germans who took part uh, in the Second World War, who um, were members of the Hitler Youth uh, or uh, also the Wehrmacht, and um, and James Sterling, uh, on the other hand, he was a member uh, of the British Army. And he was one of those soldiers who landed uh, in the Normandy on D-Day. And a D-Day member um, heard from German architects that he would have, that he was about to bring fascist architecture back to Germany, which is uh, almost like a, a strange, um, highly disturbing, actually, projection. Um, Anyway, um, the competition uh, and the debate took place in 1977 and uh, six years later the um, building, the new Stadtkirche, was completed in 1983. It uh, is a masterpiece of architecture, definitely um, one of the most, for me, one of the most important buildings in the late 20th century, uh, highly um, uh, artistic, uh, um, balance between monumental and playful uh, parts and um, uh, I won't go into the details of this building now. He, we see uh, James Sterling uh, he, um, uh, in the, sitting in the middle uh, of his rotunda of uh, his new Staatsgallery in Stuttgart with um, uh, yeah, with um, others, with a uh, museum director and um, uh, state architects, etc. And um, maybe in this uh, meeting, it's just a very uh, sloppy theory, uh, he, uh, James Sterling, came up with the idea of a very subtle, a very beautiful Revenge. And this revenge got published in this book here, um, where we uh, can, uh, where we can finally find this image here. A complete shock for the unprepared reader, um, and it, uh, yeah, it's obviously a, a doppelganger of. Uh, out of Hitler sitting in James Sterling's and Michael Wilford's rotunda of the Neue Staatsgallery. And the image caption is <laughs> not very detailed, a visitor to the Staatsgalerie. Until now, uh, we don't know anything uh, about this image. We don't know if uh, James Sterling really uh, organized this image with a doppelganger, with a with, um, uh, with an actor, we, uh, we, but we know that uh, in the early 1980s, in the middle of the 1980s, there was actually a, um, a doppelganger active, uh, Adolf Hitler doppelganger active in the Staatsgalerie. What we don't know is if he was photographed by accident uh, in the Staatsgalerie and uh, James Sterling found this image, or if James Sterling and Michael Wilford really organized this image. Anyway, that's how um, postmodernism arrived in modern Stuttgart. It's um, for me a deeply fascinating story. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. All the best.